Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's event. Today, we're honored to present the product of the Council's Independent Task Force on Federal Priorities, a roadmap for federal action on safety and justice. I'm Abby Walsh, the Council's Director, here with a few notes before we begin our program. We will be joined by nearly 300 participants today. To ensure a quality experience for everyone, all lines will be muted, but we do wanna hear from you. So throughout today's session, you can submit questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, or email us at info at councilonCJ.org at any time during this call. When possible, please indicate a specific speaker for your question. We will be presenting 25 to 30 minutes of discussion moderated by John Tilley, Council Senior Fellow and former Secretary of Kentucky's Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. Then we will turn to your questions. Over the last month, we've welcomed nearly 2,500 listeners to our call series on the impacts of COVID-19 on the criminal justice system. To those listeners, welcome back. For newcomers, we'll begin with a word on the Council. The Council on Criminal Justice was founded to advance understanding of the criminal justice policy choices facing the nation and build consensus for solutions that enhance safety and justice for all. A think tank and invitational membership organization, we are guided by the belief that a fair and effective justice system is vital to democracy and a core measure of our nation's well-being. Task forces combine the dual strengths of the council, bringing the greatest minds in criminal justice together to address the field's critical issues. It's important to note that while council leadership selects task force topics, and council staff and consultants provide support, task forces are solely responsible for the content of their reports. Neither the council's board of directors, trustees, nor staff approve or disapprove of the reports. They present the consensus of the task force members and do not constitute a position of the council at large. Today, we released the report of the council's first of what will be many task forces. Following the passage of the First Step Act in late 2018, there was both a tremendous sense of accomplishment and a recognition that strong implementation and further action would be necessary. Seizing on that momentum, the Council's leadership formed the Task Force on Federal Priorities, calling together some of the most experienced, knowledgeable, and dedicated people from across the field and asking them to come to consensus on realistic, actionable next steps. The task force's work was facilitated by Strategic Applications International, informed by many organizations in the field, including the Crime and Justice Institute at Community Resources for Justice, and funded in part by Arnold Ventures. To these partners and the many experts who contributed their perspective toward today's report, we send our thanks. What we knew then in June 2019 was that the challenges facing the criminal justice system are many multifaceted and required diligent, sustained action. What we couldn't have known is that COVID-19 waited around the corner. The task force completed its work before the COVID-19 outbreak, yet many of its recommendations are all the more relevant and urgent in the face of the pandemic. Now, I'm honored to introduce the council's chair, nine-term US Congressman and former governor of Georgia, Nathan Deal. Governor Deal, can you hear us? I can, yes. You can take it away, sir. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's good afternoon to everyone who's on the line. I, I'm glad that you could join us. It's been a great honor for me to partner with the Council on Criminal Justice as the chair of the Task Force on Federal Priorities. The report we're releasing today reflects the expertise and wisdom of many exceptional and committed people. And I believe our recommendations are realistic and achievable, yet also capable of producing profound changes if they are ad adopted. When the task force began this work last year, we could hardly have anticipated how the world was gonna change. I believe it was essential to follow up at that time on the gains accomplished by the First Step Act. But today, the proposals in our report seem far more urgent. COVID-19 has illustrated in deadly fashion some of the weaknesses of our criminal justice system and the vulnerabilities of those who live and work within it. Many of our recommendations are directly relevant to the pandemic and the stress it has placed on our system. 
eliminating mandatory minimum sentences for drug crimes is just one example. An overdue step that would safely reduce the number of Americans imprisoned for nonviolent crimes while leaving the courts with discretion to take truly dangerous people off the streets. We also have a set of recommendations to support returning citizens, a cause especially close to my heart. One is a clean slate proposal to seal certain records from public view, giving formerly incarcerated people a better chance of getting a job. Others provide support for housing and health care, so important right now. Given our mission and our focus on the federal system, the task force did not address many pressing issues of the day, including the threat of white nationalism, gun safety, and the use of cash bail. In some cases, it was clear that the federal government has a limited role to play on those issues. In others, we concluded that the issues required further research and analysis, or that Congress was not likely to agree on a remedy. In closing, I'd like to point out that our task force was a very diverse group. And while we did not see eye to eye on everything, we all share a strong commitment to protecting the safety and liberty of our fellow Americans. We also firmly believe that we must use facts, data, and evidence as we work to move our justice system forward. That, of course, is what the Council on Criminal Justice is all about. I look forward to favorable consideration of our proposals by the Congress and the administration and to the discussion over this next hour. Now let's turn our attention to Senator Mike Lee. Senator Lee, a great champion of safety and justice, is a member of the council's board of trustees, and he's provided us with some taped remarks. Hi, I'm Senator Mike Lee. I wish I could be with all of you today to help celebrate the release of your new task force report on further federal action for criminal justice reform. There's so much we've already accomplished together, and I look forward to working with each of you to accomplish more. If anything, this current coronavirus crisis has only shown how important our work is. Not only has the reduction in mandatory minimums helped shrink the size of the federal prison population, but the improvements put in place by the First Step Act have also made it possible for the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Prisons to more effectively respond to the current crisis. While the spread of the disease in federal prisons has been fast and deeply concerning, it's undoubtedly been mitigated by the reductions in the prison population that we've seen since and because of the passage of the First Step Act. The improvements to the Compassionate Release Program have become especially important during this global pandemic. And I applaud Attorney General Barr, who swiftly called for a temporary expansion of Compassionate Release as part of the Bureau of Prisons COVID-19 response. We continue to work to ensure that the First Step Act is implemented properly and as intended. For example, we're championing S3035, which would clarify that good time credits and compassionate release should work synergistically. We're also working with Senator John Cornyn on the Reenter Act, also known as the Recognizing Education, Employment, New Skills, and treatment to enable reintegration act. This bill would allow federal judges to certify that former inmates have successfully reintegrated into society. This certification could act as sort of a de facto expungement of sorts for prior convictions for purposes of employment, licensing, education, and housing. It would allow employers to use the certificate to rebut tort claims for hiring former inmates. I look forward to reading the report that you're releasing today and continuing to work with you as we all strive to make our criminal justice system fairer and safer. Thanks for all you do and God bless you. We'll now welcome Council Senior Fellow John Tilley to moderate today's discussion. 
Thank you, Abby. Yeah. Back on screen in just a moment here. We want to thank uh, Senator Lee for his comments and contribution to the field and, and most notably, um, his service to the Council on Criminal Justice as a trustee. That uh, goes without saying. Again, I'm John Tilly, as Abby mentioned. I first served as a task force member um, before I transitioned to being a senior fellow at the Council. I think it's important that we jump right to the heart of the matter. In the next 30 minutes, we have to cover leaving time for your questions. So please begin to pose those questions um, as they come to you. So we're gonna start with uh, Mark Holton in just a minute as you see him on the screen, but we have a distinguished panel, each of whom I served with today. We're gonna talk about as many of the 15 recommendations that the task force made along with the implementation steps, but we're gonna begin with those that are, that are most relevant in the moment We'll try to cover as many as we can. And Mark, again, longtime Coke Industries Senior VP, General Counsel, current Americans for Prosperity's board member, uh, reform warrior, as he has been called. Mark, we're going to start with second look. It's hard to, to, to really pick one that's most relevant, so we won't do that. But probably none more than, than a compassionate release, as Senator Lee has mentioned, and the importance of a second look in our system. Um, tell us about it and why it's so important now. Sure. Thank you, uh, John, and thank Governor Deal and Senator um, Lee as well. It's, it's an honor to be here today. And so um, I first want to just start off saying how excited we are uh, to be able to put these potential reforms out there. And what we're doing is completely consistent with the First Step Act. It's completely consistent with public safety, justice and fairness, second chances, um, you name it. It's all about rehabilitation. Uh, redemption and and reformation and restoration for people and second look fits right into this it's consistent with the whole fiber of the first step back and what we're trying to do and the whole idea is that in the federal system we have um, somewhere between 45,000 or so people and that's about 30 percent of the population who are serving sentences longer than uh, 15 years and a significant number of them are over the age of 55. And as the science and data has shown that incarcerating older people pays fewer dividends from a, from a uh, crime control strategy because people are less likely to commit crimes as they get older, particularly violent crimes. Um, also prison costs go up as people get older uh, and they're really expensive when you're trying to do it inside a prison and not as effective as it would be outside of prison. It's mainly due to medical needs. There's so much money um, has to be used in that uh, regard. Uh, we've got long sentences for some people, and some of them are warranted, and they will always be warranted. That's just kind of how it is. But we believe that people should be allowed to seek a second chance and reconsideration of their lengthy sentences in the interest of justice and cost-effective crime control. You know, but the fact is, back in 1987, we no longer have federal parole. Um, and so opportunities for a reduced sentence for people um, who don't fit into certain uh, segments of, uh, of, of various laws is, is minimal. And these opportunities lead to people aging out in prison, dying in prison. And so what we're trying to do is, you know, focus on things where we can make a difference. So if you look at, you mentioned the compassionate release, it's pretty excited, but it, it's Right now, it's a statute allowing for consideration of early release uh, where extraordinary or compelling reasons exist. Um, it's really gotten buffed up and uh, supercharged by the first step app, but it's still being worked out what that means, what that language means. Um, by and large, people who don't hit a, a, a particular statute, if it's uh, made retroactive, like the uh, Fair Sentencing Act, they, they could petition to get out for that. But there are many people in federal prisons who don't get those opportunities. And so the whole idea is that we should be trying to help people who are working hard, who are doing all the right things um, while in prison um, and giving them a second chance. That's even more important as we, we talked about, we heard the governor talk about and Senator Lee talk about with the uh, pandemic, with COVID-19. Um, it's led to people coming into prison some of them end up with, you know, in, in life sentences almost because they're getting uh, sick and dying in prison. And we don't want to see that happen either. So the whole idea is that uh, giving people a shot at a, at a second look 
would give them incentives to complete the different programs, whether it's education, skills, drug treatment, whatever it might be, and they'll maintain good behavior. Incentives matter. Incentives matter everywhere, and they matter in prisons. And we've seen that with the First Step Act, how people have tried to change their ways so they could get out earlier. So that record, so to speak, of people who were in prison, um, to the, if, if we could get the um, Second Look Act passed, if we could get that happen, uh, if that could happen, uh, they could use whatever they've done in prison as a way to get maybe a reduction in their sentence, their prison sentence. And we think it's a, the right thing to do. It's a smart thing to do. Um, there was a bill last year with uh, Senator Booker and Congresswoman Bass called the Matthew Charles and William Underwood Act, which would have addressed this. The whole idea is that people after their 15 years in prison, regardless of what they're in prison for, um, and if they have a longer prison sentence, it doesn't matter, 15 years, they can petition a court for reseeking to change their um, sentencing or time served or whatever it might be. And if they get that through, if they are, uh, the judge allows it, that's great. If not, they can do it every 10 years. They can come back after every, each 10 years and try to get out again. And we think that makes a lot of sense and is warranted in these circumstances. It's something that we know that um, uh, a lot of different groups have been in favor of, and we think it will really fill gaps and help us get from the tough on crime era, where we took a lot of things away, really when we are now in the smart on crime era, and this would be a really good tool to help people have hope in prison, make, safe, make it safer in prison for everybody, and give them a second chance, and save a lot of money, and also last, but certainly not least, uh, also we're, we're leaving a lot of human potential um, out there that is never getting a chance, and that's just immoral in my opinion. No, thank you, Mark. And you hit on, on some of the specifics that are attached with the implementation steps. These were well thought out. These are politically actionable items. They're viable. Uh, they, 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 again, achieve a middle ground with something we can do, politics being the art of the doable. And you hit on those things. We thank you for that and your work on the First Step Act. This is that next step. Mayor Nutter, we're going to come to you next as someone who's been a champion for so many things, former mayor of Philadelphia, former president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, so your influence to all the leaders we have in our cities. So much going on there. Also, thank you for your service as a member and a trustee to the council. You're passionate about reentry. So when, when the recommendation was, was raised to seal criminal records from public view, to give those folks that clean slate we talk about, why was this such a priority for the task force? Well, uh, John, thank you. And to, to my fellow panelists, uh, the, the issue is, um, you know, and Mark touched on this a little bit, you did whatever you did or you were accused of whatever you accused of, or you were found guilty. You served your time, whatever the time is. The question is, when is the time actually over? When are you able to start to re-enter society, uh, fully participate, uh, having served your sentence uh, and, and uh, fulfilled your commitment uh, to, you know, either the, the local city, the county, the state, uh, or the federal government. And the ability to uh, get a job, get housing, start to get your life back is critical uh, to uh, uh, breaking, if you will, the cycle of uh, recidivism. Uh, we know that uh, just it's been studied. Uh, you know, those first three months uh, that, that you're home, if you can't reconnect uh, in serious ways, uh, there are some true dangers uh, to uh, possibly returning uh, to the life you knew, uh, or eventually potentially to to prison. So reentry for me uh, in Philadelphia, and as I talk to mayors across the country, I looked at reentry as a part of a crime reduction strategy. Uh, people who are working, people who are engaged, people who are active, uh, just a have less time and often less interest uh, in being back in the life, uh, if you will. Uh, Folks want to get a job, they need good housing, they need to take care of their families, uh, they become taxpaying uh, citizens, they're contributing back to society. Uh, and also you will see where there are significant efforts at reentry, you will see a reduction uh, in crime because you really just took, you know, another person uh, out, of, uh, out of the game. If, if, uh, if you will, to use the, uh, use the vernacular. So um, that's that. Uh, Mark also touched, it's the human potential. I mean, 
you know, there are no throwaway lives. And uh, ex except for, you know, obviously the most uh, egregious, the most uh, horrific uh, types of crime, uh, in many instances, uh, local, state, federal, most people are coming home. And so if you, something happens and you're in Philadelphia, you go you either stay up on state road in the city and the facilities that we have, or you go to a, a state a facility at some point in time. I mean, it's not like they move, people are moving to Kansas. Uh, I mean, they're coming right back uh, to where they were. Uh, and uh, so we tried to create a mindset that you should start thinking about reentry uh, programs and services on the first day you go in, because in many instances, you know, that person is going to come back out. Uh, and uh, it's often too late uh, as they gather their things and, and put it in a bag and get on the SEPTA bus or uh, some other, uh, or a friend comes to pick you up and suddenly you have to start trying to put your life back together. So uh, reentry services should actually be ongoing in the facility. The barriers and obstacles to getting employment, getting a driver's license, getting your, your, your ID, getting housing, uh, we really need to uh, focus on. And I would say in the midst of the pandemic, uh, the steps that uh, many uh, uh, government agencies have taken to reduce the population for health uh, purposes and releasing those who are nonviolent and a series of steps. The question is, well, what are those systems going to do if ever this is you know, completely over or anybody's notion of a return uh, to normal? There are steps being taken today that should be the reforms of tomorrow. Uh, in uh, in criminal justice, and folks should look at 2020 um, uh, from a criminal justice standpoint as an inflection point, and when we made some serious decisions that maybe under no other set of uh, human or political circumstances uh, we would have been willing to do, but now they're actually the right thing to do for a whole lot of reasons, uh, and I am hopeful that this work and the report uh, will uh, continue to inspire those who are inclined and push some others uh, to relook at the entire criminal justice system from a totally different lens. There's no way in the world that we should go back uh, to some of the things that were going on pre-COVID uh, when we now realize uh, that they are, in essence, the right thing to do anyway. Oh, great, great points, Mayor. And we're going to come back to Mayor Nutter to talk about health care and housing as it relates to everyone, but specifically, you know, cities um, and those thousands who come home. But we're going to move to Eddie and we're going to stay on this concept of the clean slate, the fresh start, Eddie. Some have noted 70 million Americans, it's been estimated, have some touch with the criminal justice system. You know, without this um, convenient way to, uh, to seal a record, this automatic uh, sealing of a record, it's, it's difficult and it's awkward for people. They won't take that step because of the complexities and the fear that exists with that. Um, and even though this tool hasn't been rigorously evaluated, you see it on the streets of your city. So talk about why it's important. Sure, um, John, and thank you everybody for their remarks uh, thus far. I mean, here's the bottom line. Uh, and speaking very openly, uh, I'm someone who's been formerly incarcerated, and yet here I am managing one of the largest anti-violence programs in the country, the Bay of Chicago. And these policies at the state level are relatively new, and you have to be rigorously evaluated. That is true. But the task force concluded that the evidence on the collateral impacts of criminal records is clear. And I see that in my work every day as, as, as your question reflects. I see it with our participants in our program. I see it in other participants in other programs. I see it across the country as I continue to uh, be informed about best practices. And the bottom line is that, you know, we as a society, as, in terms of the criminal justice system, continue to create barriers for many of these men and women uh, upon their release instead of creating a more viable pathway for success. And we're talking about the large portion of the folks that, that are coming home, the, the low level case offenses. And I would even make the argument that this is the beginning of us to continue to learn more so that we could think about, not just as Mayor Nutter pointed out, uh, looking at the sin, right, of the, of the individual, but thinking about how do we create a pathway of redemption, a pathway into society in which they could be contributing members as well. Because uh, it's clear that the people that are mostly impacted by this are, are for the most part, families who are minorities, families that come from, from urban communities, 
uh, and predominantly black and brown uh, communities as well. I think the other thing that I would mention uh, is that automatically seeming records, you know, can help people and their families move forward uh, while improving public safety by reducing recidivism. And this is, there's so much evidence around this. And I'm, I'm hoping that maybe Nancy gets a chance to kind of highlight some of that, but, but there's so much research right now that I think contrary to public belief, there is so much evidence that tells us otherwise. Um, <clears throat> and so I think it's, 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 uh, it's not right to allow the stain of one's past to remain uh, as an uh, inevitable, or as, as, as what um, uh, Mayor Nutter just pointed out, continuously just look at the downside or the downfall of people's mistakes. Um, we have to find ways to re bring them back into the community and we have to find ways to create this pathway. And lastly, uh, this is even more important during the time of COVID. Um, you know, right now in the last three months or so, what we've been seeing with even our participants is that not only are we seeing some of the challenges prior that they've been facing, you know, surface up, you know, twofold, fourfold, but we're seeing other challenges that in the state of Illinois, we've had so many policies that have gone, you know, what I would say have gone out of their way to make it even more challenging for some of our folks that are returning back home from prison. But I could say the same thing for many states across the United States. Absolutely. And Eddie, I, I failed to mention that you are the Senior Director of Ready Chicago. You mentioned this leading violence prevention program. And so, again, your expertise, we're going to come back to talk about the, the very things you see with violence, uh, violence prevention, violence reduction, and also, you know, victims and survivors of crime, what, what the task force recommends to support victims and survivors and reduce violence. So we'll come back to that. And thank you for your service also as a trustee and member of the council. Nancy Levine, um, obviously Vice President, Justice Policy Urban. Nancy, you know, I've known all, all of you for some time. Nancy, you and I go way back and, and you were able to, to pull me through an event one time. Thank you for that. But your, your service on the Colson Task Force comes to mind, especially given this next topic, and that's prison oversight, especially Bureau of Prison Oversight at the federal level. So um, let's, let's talk about that uh, first, and we'll come back to mandatory minimums to talk with you for a minute. So well, let's talk prison oversight first. Sure. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with so many distinguished panelists. And it's been a real joy to see this task force report uh, come to fruition after a lot of hard work um, by many. So congratulations to the council for that. Um, so prisons in the United States are remarkably closed systems. Um, despite being publicly funded entities, um, I can't think of any other public sector where there's such an egregious lack of transparency and accountability. Um, there's very little in the way of data that's required to be publicly disseminated about what happens behind the bars in prisons, and not just to the people who are incarcerated there, but the people who work there as well. Um, so the Federal Bureau of Prisons is of course no different. And um, as you mentioned, John, the Colson Task Force on Federal Corrections Reform a few years ago documented a whole host of problems in the BOP. Sadly, those problems are no different today. Um, they include inadequate staffing levels um, uh, that can threaten their health and safety and the health and safety of the incarcerated population. Um, we documented a shortage of programs and treatment to help prepare people for successful release and reentry. And while the First Step Act funds more uh, programs and treatment, there's some concern of late that the BOP may not be implementing the first step as it was intended. Who's watching over the BOP to make sure that they do so? Not really anybody. And that leads to the recommendation of the task force and that's to establish an oversight board, an oversight body um, who would be independent, who would have access to um, entry to the prison, uh, to data from the prison, complaints, uh, how they're resolved. Um, they would be able to document conditions of confinement, um, assess the degree to which uh, federal prisons are treating people humanely and with dignity, um, explore the, the programming and uh, treatment uh, options, and importantly, also look at issues around correctional staff, officer wellness, officer health. All of these issues are integral. You can't have a well-run prison if you're not caring for the people who work there. Um, so the task force recommends the establishment of this board. It would, be, um, it would also include 
a charge to develop what I would call loosely um, a mandatory whistleblowing policy, a policy whereby um, it is a requirement as staff in the Federal Bureau of Prisons to report misconduct and abuse, and that you could be reprimand, reprimanded or disciplined if you don't report that. Um, the a recommendation also calls for the creation of a correctional ombudsman. Um, these exist in some states, but, but not enough of them. The ombudsman would respond to complaints about conditions and practices in the BOP, but they could also field uh, requests uh, from loved ones of incarcerated people. Um, and particularly in the time of COVID, uh, this is huge. And people are calling, wondering like, what's happening with my husband, my cousin, my mother, uh, my son. Um, they don't know what's going on and there's no central resource to find out where they are and if they're safe. And Nancy, understanding how much you, you value research and, and, you know, again, the evidence that exists. I know you were just emailing this morning about the importance of it and some of the finer points here. The, the task force recommended that this, all the things you mentioned, but not that the board would have any operational control, correct? No, no operational control. I don't believe that was part of the recommendation. Yeah. And that's based on some research that suggests that's the most effective way uh, to, to oversee an operation like this. Is that correct as well? Well, I, you know what, I know you want me to say yes, but I think that there's not enough research on oversight entities out there. Uh, but what we do know is uh, the result of all manner of sunshine laws, including those that require transparency and data right. on, on what's happening. And this would be afforded through the establishment of the oversight board. Oh, and as, as a task force member, I can certainly say that, again, there's sunshine is needed, and that was a consensus with the group, clearly, as if there ever was one. You know, I'm going to turn to, let, let me do this, Nancy. Uh, let me, we're going to talk about mandatory minimums. If you could, let's stick with you for a moment, and okay. then we're going we're gonna to move to Mark Holden and, and follow up on mandatories, and Mark, if you had a quick thought about prison oversight as well, I know it's important to you. I know how passionate you were there, so Nancy, tell us a little bit about you know, why the task force felt it was important to eliminate, again, a number of things, but right off the top, you know, mandatory minimums as they relate to drug offenses. Sure. Well, as you know, and I think we all do, these mandatory minimums were passed in the 1970s and 1980s in response to the drug crisis and uh, drug-related violence that was happening in communities throughout the country. It's part of the, the war on drugs or the war on crime. Um, I, they were a highly punitive response to the problem, one that I would say is akin to using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Um, but that was the way it was at the time. It, they were born from the belief that we could incarcerate ourselves out of problems or incarcerate others, largely black men. Um, and we know now that that's just not the case. Um, instead of creating greater public safety, uh, mandatory minimums have yielded a ton of harm, right? They've led to tremendous growth in the Federal Bureau of Prisons and in uh, prisons across the country for that matter. Um, they've led to crowding that has created unsafe conditions for staff and for incarcerated people. They've diverted uh, money from programs and treatment and things that can help people succeed on the outside uh, to just you know, more concrete and razor wire. Um, they've led to exceedingly long sentences that disrupt lives, both of the people who are serving time and their families on the outside. And they cost taxpayers billions of dollars. Um, now, how do mandatory minimums work? Um, well, they work by hamstringing judges. Um, basically, they're tied to the quantity of drugs that um, you have on you and if you're convicted as a, a drug trafficker and um, rather than roles. So that creates scenarios where a very low level courier might serve more time than a drug kingpin. Um, they also are just outsized, you know, they don't uh, enable any kind of consideration of any ameliorating circumstances associated with the case. Um, research finds that the long sentences that come from mandatory minimums have absolutely no relationship uh, to reduced recidivism. And research also finds that low, long sentences uh, do not result in reductions in supply or demand of drugs or the purity of drugs on the street. Um, so there's absolutely no reason to continue with this practice. And that's why the task force believes that the time has come to eliminate mandatory minimums for drug offenses in the federal system. 
And in, in closing, I will just share a little COVID pastime. Um, my 19 year old son who finished up his first year of college back home, just started watching West Wing for the first time. And it's the first time for him. He was born in 2001. Uh, it's been nostalgic for my husband and I, we, we watch with him. And um, it's really a, an amazing at, that so many of the topics that were relevant back then um, are relevant today. So two nights ago, it was the mandatory minimum episode. Last week, it was um, uh, the crack cocaine disparity episode. Um, and that was almost to date. That first aired 20 years ago from today. And Amazing. so little has changed. Yes, there have been steps. The first step is one, the Fair Sentencing Act is another, but they haven't gone far enough. And we really have to go further, and particularly because of the incredibly harmful impact that mandatory minimums have on black and brown uh, people and communities and particularly black men. Yeah, you know, well said, Nancy. And again, these 15 recommendations, we think just provide that roadmap, the very thing that, that you talk about there. And, and Mark, I've got to have, have your quick take uh, on mandatories, or if you have a quick quick take on prison oversight. I know the both, you know, again, things about what you're passionate. Yeah, no, so on, on the prison oversight, I think Nancy did a great job as usual. I, um, I just think that, and I've said this before, that the Bureau of Prison, if they could just change their name to get into the early 80s uh, from a prison, from Bureau of Prison to Bureau of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I, I was a prison guard when I was in college in Worcester, Mass. Many of you heard this, and we didn't do a whole lot of corrections, but we called it the, the Department of Corrections. But that just sets the tone, and uh, hopefully it's going to get better, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Unfortunately, the, the pandemic may be the reason it happens, unfortunately. Um, you know, Mark, I heard someone say one time, there's nothing inherently corrective about many departments of corrections. So yeah, again, well said, but again, you know, mandatory minimums as well. Yeah, the mandatory minimum. So I, really, um, I've never been a fan. I think the war on drugs, uh, Nancy, you know, handled that very well, obviously, but it's, it's always, in my opinion, been about um, pol politicking elections and race baiting. And that's a terrible thing to say, but it's true. And the mandatory minimums, you know, it's just th th this whole issue, all it's done is, as we know, changed the, the whole transfer of power went from judges, Article Three judges or judges in the states, to prosecutors. And they, you know, rule the roost now. And we've seen the outcomes. And I, I get so tired of hearing these stories about these awful people who have done these different things. And the reality is that, you know, most of the folks who get caught up in the system are people like, let's say, an Alice Johnson. You know, Alice Johnson had a, you know, if you didn't know Alice, she had a life plus 25 year uh, sentence and she was a low level figure. But going back to the fact that we don't have meaningful intent standards in conspiracy law, particularly in judge cons um, in, in drug conspiracies, anybody can get it because you're all in for it. And, you know, if Alice hadn't been committed, she'd probably die in prison. We've seen that again and again. Unfortunately, you know, the first person who died in a federal prison um, it, as the pandemic, Patrick Jones in Louisiana, he was a low-level drug offender who unfortunately was arrested. He had a 27-year um, um, sentence because of the 100 to 1 crack um, issue. Uh, that's another problem <laughs> that we need to fix from 18 to 1 to 1 to 1. But anyway, um, he tried to get out under the first step back. They wouldn't let him out. The prosecutor said, no, he's a dangerous person. He wasn't. He was a low-level offender. He died. You've got also and Andrea Circle Bear. Um, she was um, put into prison back in January of this year. Uh, she was a low-level offender. She had a two-year, 26-month sentence. Uh, she was pregnant, and they still put her in prison. And she died. They had her on a ventilator. She and her child was born inside a prison, federal prison. And you know, the, she died three days later. It's like, what are we doing here? You know, we we, we had to pass a law back in the uh, uh, in, in the First Step Act to say that we would no longer shackle uh, women while they're giving birth to their children. Like, we needed a law for that. But I guess we need a lot a bunch of other laws here. So, yeah. the, the the mandatory minimums, I'd get rid of all of them, particularly for drugs. And to the extent that we, it, what Nancy said is exactly true. We had this in drafts of the first step back, but it didn't make it into the end. Do it by what the persons, what they actually did, because intent does matter. And what we end up seeing are the Alice Johnsons, the Chris Youngs. Chris Young, you know his story too, a low level offender, right. now has life in prison. 
the judge, Kevin Sharp, who had to sentence him, right. stepped down from the court from being a federal judge after that. So this can't happen fast enough for me. And we're going to have to hit it hard because there's a lot of people out there. I was looking at my, my um, Facebook today who think that mandatory minimums still are the thing to do. But it's really been a stain on our, uh, on our democracy, I think. And it's one of those issues when you know better, you need to do better. Unfortunately, yeah. we knew better back in the Nixon administration, and we haven't done better till now. So very excited about this, and hopefully it'll get through. Yeah, Mark, obviously the need for that common sense reform resonates with all of us and those on the call. I'm, I'm certain the questions are piling up. Quickly, we're going to hit Eddie, you, and then Mayor Nutter with the final two, and then we're going to jump into our Q&A session. Uh, you know, again, if we can reduce these sentences, um, Mayor Nutter, successfully, as we have done, but more work is needed. What about when folks return, as you've talked about? What, why is healthcare and housing, start with housing, reentry housing, you've, we've talked about it. Why is, why is that so important and the task force felt the need to be specific in its recommendation? Well, I mean, it's certainly not rocket science. Uh, it may not even be science. Um, you know, where would any of us be? if we didn't have a uh, clean, safe, decent roof over our heads. I mean, it's, it really is one of the fundamentals of having any kind of life. And so, you know, the, there are numerous obstacles, uh, both federally imposed, and uh, there may be some states, so not a, certainly not a state's expert, uh, that, um, you know, if you have a previous criminal record, you're not even eligible. To, to either get that housing or participate in, in a variety of programs. And so, again, what, what's a person supposed to do? Right now, how many friends' couches can, can you stay on? Um, uh, you know, the challenges of public housing, uh, depending on, you know, if you have a, a previous uh, criminal record, uh, you could literally endanger your entire household. Uh, just by being uh, on uh, on those premises. And so again, I, I go back to the fundamentals of what are we trying to accomplish here? Absolutely. Their time, they're now out, what's, what's the point? Um, so can't get a roof over your head. Already challenges, um, and certainly in a current, can't even say post, in a current COVID environment, pre-COVID, tough for formerly incarcerated, now, you know, virtually impossible. I mean, you're competing with, you know, thousands of people, millions of people, uh, rather, uh, who are now uh, out of work. Um, there are provisions, I believe, in uh, either the CARES Act or PPP um, that, again, specifically targeted against people who have a previous criminal record. I mean, this is still, you know, fomenting in the minds of folks about, you know, how we just keep people down, keep people down, keep people down, uh, and, um, and, and make life difficult for them. So um, I think changes in housing policy, changing uh, uh, employment uh, opportunities, you know, I would often say to uh, many of my companies, uh, you know, when I was in office, I said, you know, look, you're either going to uh, see that person in the workplace or you may see them in the alley. You decide. You know, which, which do you want to do? Folks are going to, I'm not, I condone none of this, but people are going to do what they're going to do uh, if their backs are to the wall. And any one of us might, uh, you know, for all of our life successes, uh, we don't know what we would do uh, if we had no money, had no place to stay, can't get a job, uh, doors are closing your face constantly, you've got that pressure uh, going on. And so re-entry really has to be uh, a very high level uh, aspect, uh, again, People come back to where they were. Most are coming back to cities, uh, which is often where uh, the original crime may have been uh, committed. So I, I am very passionate about this point, and uh, we've got to change some of the mindset. Uh, Mark talked about you know uh, stats and science and information and, and data. Um, you know we, we can't let our hearts uh, and old mindsets uh, completely rule uh, in in the 21st century. Oh, thank you, Mayor. And again, it's it's clear that the need for that reentry housing, and I would invite all of those who haven't viewed and reviewed the report yet to look at the, the specifics and the nuances and the complications of the issue. And, and, and again, the task force implementation steps to actually make this happen. So we'll talk about healthcare later if we can, and maybe in the Q&A. Um, Eddie, quickly, I know you're our anchor leg, and we've done this to you more than once now, my friend. If you could very quickly hit on why it's so important that we take an evidence-based approach to reducing violence and then also just go ahead and touch on the support we're giving 
and we hope to offer by way of recommendation to victims and the survivors of crime. Sure. So a couple of things, John. <clears throat> um, so I was in a call maybe two weeks ago with uh, NIJ. So that's the National Institute for Justice. And in that call, you had folks from the Department of Justice and a couple other federal uh, departments there. In this call, you had about maybe 10, 12 scholars that I, I like just worship their research, psychologists, sociologists, and social workers <clears throat> from various institutions. And the, the topic was really around gangs and gang violence. And so here's what I took away from that, from that conversation. You have all these smart people, great people, and yet despite of the resources that we're putting in there from the federal level to the local level, um, if you're running a after school program or in school program, we associate it as a violence prevention uh, initiative. And I think there's, there's a failure there to really recognize uh, the specific population, which is a very small population that are actually the drivers of violence. And not only the drivers, but they're also more likely to be the victims of violence. We often forget that um, the research is also telling us that most perpetrators of violence prior to that were also victims. And there's something to be said about that, which I'm hoping in just a minute or two, I'll, I'll be able to chance to uh, highlight that. Here's the point that I'm making behind that. Ultimately, it's not just about funding programs out there. It's not just about funding efforts around violence prevention. It is about funding the right kind of initiatives. It's about funding the right kind of research. And it's about really focusing on this very small uh, group of population at the, at, the, at the tip of the spear who are really the drivers of that violence. And we have to double down, which means that we had to think about innovation, we had to think about um, best practices, and to think about in a way that the small nonprofits in the communities could also be able to implement that. We need to build the capacity in, in many of these organizations. And here, here's why I say this, and I'll summarize it very quickly. You know, so violent crimes in the United States have fallen substantially uh, from their peak in the early 1990s. This is a time that I grew up, I was 18 years old, I went to prison at 18, came home when I was 32 in 2008. So we're talking in Chicago, we were seeing homicides between 900 to 1,000. LA was even much more than that. And yet the country still suffers far more homicides per capita than any other wealthy nation. In 2018, the last year uh, for which we, official, we, we have official data, uh, we know that about 44 people per day were murdered in the US. These are people with families. These are people who had dreams and aspirations, who had challenges, um, but these, these homicides, these shootings also don't just happen in isolation. They have an impact in the same communities that many of these families are trying to raise their kids. <clears throat> Urban violence also accounts for more murders in the United States than any other form of violence. Since September 11 of 2001, hundreds of citizens have died in terrorist attacks and mass shootings. But during the same period of time, more than 100,000 people have died from violence in the city streets. I mean, just this weekend alone, uh, with Memorial Day weekend in Chicago, we had over 10 people killed, nearly 3,000 people shot. And just yesterday, as I read my report this morning, we have about 20 shootings that happened with others that, that were also killed. So really, while we might see a reduction in violence for the people who have to bury their kids, it is real. It is real, and they don't care to hear that violence is being reduced. It's important that as a nation we see that. We also have to understand why is that, and then also, even if, even if most of our attention for, are for non-violent um, non offenders, we also have to think about many of these individuals who have violent offenses are also at some point or another gonna come back to our cities. What are we doing to support them? And what are we also doing to prevent some of these men and women from potentially being perpetrators of violence or victims? Obviously, there's a lot more that I could say, but I'll conclude by saying this point is out. The economic costs <clears throat> are staggering. A single murder uh, cost in the nation averages about $10 million uh, as it relates to the criminal justice and the medical cost, the low wages and the earnings and the damage that really is associated to these shootings. In fact, there was an early re report this morning that I'm trying to remember the name right now, but it'll come to mind later, uh, that was released uh, from a city in, in California that their average just from that city was about eight, $8.5 million uh, as a result of a homicide. So think about how we could use that money and really put it into social service. Because if nothing else, COVID has taught us is how our priorities in terms of our investment in the criminal justice system versus supporting our average citizen that, that, that have these needs in our, in our country and we're not necessarily 
you know, putting our efforts and our resources there. Okay. Yeah, again, way to take us home. I, I know we have lots of questions piling up, Abby. Again, would encourage everyone to know we just hit the tip um, of this, just dipped our toe in the waters of this report. I uh, encourage everyone to read it and review. Abby, again, if you're on the line now, I know we have some questions from our, from our audience and uh, those have been emailed as, as well. John, I'm happy to uh, hop in with a question. Mayor Nutter, though, it's, it sounded like you may have a, a follow-up point you uh, wanted I, to make. Oh, I'm sorry. I no. was, uh, yeah, John, I'm sorry. Um, oh. Eddie, I think I, I may have had an audio uh, little interference when you were going through uh, this past weekend. Can you give us those uh, stats again? Yeah, sure. So hmm. this weekend, we've had the most homicides in the last five years, sadly. When we're supposed to be, you know, um, honoring our veterans. In fact, I was in Kentucky uh, John, just in your backyard, uh, Fort Campbell, visiting my brother as he's being deployed to Iraq. Uh, he's about to go, in, go into quarantine. You know, 17 years in the, in the military and, I, and you know, seven deployments. And I just constantly, you know, think about his safety. But I think about the safety of the, of the people that we're serving, you know. And I think about, you know, uh, Mayor, this weekend we had um, nearly three dozen shootings. We had 10 three homicides. Yeah, nearly three dozen. And then we had just yesterday another 20, 20 shootings with additional homicides. This is within a four day window. And it's a city, in the city of Chicago, we're, we're a vibrant you know, city. Um, but the question is that we keep doing strategies that we were doing 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. We're not putting support behind real evidence uh, initiatives that are out there. We're not necessarily leveraging our best practices. And that's, that's to me the call of action on a very personal level for the folks in this call. That's why this recommendation is really critical for us about where we're putting federal dollars behind too. And that's why I support this particular uh, recommendation. Mayor, thanks for, thanks for raising that. I think it was worth repeating. And Abby, if we can go to some questions now, I think, uh, I think that's perfect. Happy to, thank you, John. This question coming in via email from Mark Holden. Some people have written that once the First Step Act was passed, Republicans decided that was enough uh, criminal justice reform and they aren't interested in more action at this time. Are you optimistic that these recommendations will find support in Congress and in the current administration? Um, great question. And I, I, I think yes, it will. I think it definitely will. Uh, whoever is elected president in the next election, they're going to have to deal with this. And I, I think that we've already seen, quite frankly, with the Trump administration, they, they did more than any other administration had done, in my lifetime at least, on a comprehensive perspective. And I do think that there are enough Republicans now who drove these, this issue. It was a huge bipartisan vote. I think, I don't know if people realize that, in the House and the Senate, in the Senate it was 87 to 12 probably should have been at least 88 or 89. One person was out of the country and another person was mad at another senator or some other ridiculous thing. But in any event, I think there's a lot more that has to happen. And I think that the states are gonna be driving this as well though, because they deal with it more. And it, it, the bottom line is that it, it's really, in my opinion, the, the, the debate is over. And if you still go with the tough on crime era um, and you don't use data, you don't, you know, you, you don't give second chances. The states that have not reformed, um, they have more crime and it costs more. So it's, it's really just political malpractice uh, not to do this. And I do think that um, the, the Republicans, you saw Mike Lee, uh, he leads on this. And I'm very optimistic. I think particularly after um, another bruising election, this is a type of issue that can bring people together, hopefully. I'm not optimistic about a whole lot of things, but I am optimistic about that. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, our next question comes to us uh, for Nancy. Uh, oversight of the Bureau of Prisons is a helpful next step, but what, what would this board have any teeth? What authority or enforcement power should a board like this have? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a perennial problem with oversight boards. Um, we know it from looking at civilian oversight boards in the law enforcement context, and some have um, pretty sweeping authority, um, access to data, um, and ability to intervene, and others um, seem like nothing more than window dressing. I, I think in the case with this proposed oversight board, you know, everything is born from consensus, and we ended up with uh, a, an oversight entity that's somewhere in the middle. Um, it, it will have um, 
unlimited access to data. And I think that's a big piece of the puzzle here, right? The more that um, we can understand what's happening behind bars and, and measure what's happening and, and even share that data publicly, the more accountable the Bureau of Prisons will be. Um, but um, that said, you know, in the current recommendation, uh, the board would reside under the Attorney General. So that's still uh, subject to the political whims of uh, the administration, whoever it might be. Thank you, Nancy. This question is coming to us through the Q&A function in Zoom, and I encourage any of our other listeners to feel free to submit their questions there. This question is for anyone on our panel. Um, recommendation 10 uh, would provide federal courts an authority that is similar to a parole function, but stops short of federal parole. Why is the task force advocating for this avenue and not restoration of federal parole? I can just say that, uh, this is Mark, that um, if someone wants to do parole, that's great, but it's, it's you know, been, been disbanded, so to speak. I guess it could be rejuvenated at any point. I know that um, um, Lindsey Graham was talking about that earlier this year. Um, I think that's great. I, if, they wanna, if we want to do parole, wonderful. We need to do something, though, because right now we've got a lot of people in prison who don't need to be there. It's inconsistent with the data that shows that people over time, you know, either they usually get better. Um, as they get older, they're less violent. We're just wasting lives and wasting time. So, you know, we, we'd be fine, I think, with uh, the parole, but it seems like that may be a bridge too far for a lot of politicians. So instead, going with a situation where you could have someone, you know, after 15 years, petition to have their, their case heard and seen, and uh, they would be getting access during that time to um, all the different uh, innovations that happened in the first step back between education and, and, and skills, et cetera. Um, we went with that, but whatever it takes, it needs to happen. This is not gonna go away. Um, I think that a lot of this will be generational, so to speak. My children, they don't understand why we're so messed up on these things. But at this point, we really need to start moving the ball down the field because we, it's just beyond the costs. It's also just the, 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 the human, the, the lives, the, the communities that have been ruined over this, over nothing in many times. Not to say there aren't people in who need to be there for a long time, but by and large, we way overdid it. We need to ratchet it back. And we saw this as the, the probably the, 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 not the easiest, but the one that we could try to drive through Congress and uh, get a, a coalition behind. Mark, do you think it had, just, do you think the reluctance by some of the electeds, I mean, is this, you know, tangentially connected to folks being worried about, uh, you know, the next uh, Willie Horton ad uh, when they run for re-election? Yeah, absolutely. I'm from Massachusetts. That um, <laughs> it never goes away, and so I think that unfortunately, I mean, look at—I uh, don't know—we we, we want to go a little deeper. Why do we need a sentencing commission? Because you know, I know this is, these are complicated issues, but that's what we have Congress for, right? No one wants to touch this stuff, so uh, that, that's we need to start pushing it. And you know, otherwise, it would not happen at all. Quite yeah. frankly, not just the people in, in our organization. There, there's a lot of we all know different groups, etc but it needs to be driven and otherwise it, it will not happen because people you look at like what you're talking about mayor that you know that we have these 7.2 million jobs that go wanting every year and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and housing that's all gone away um you know we had discussions with the administration and a number of different politicos around political uh people around uh, the sba thing you know and the the, the, the um uh, saying that you've got collateral consequences for this it's outrageous and Right. We had friends there and they couldn't change it. So people- yeah, Pell grants, like yeah. you know, scholarship money. I mean, it's just we need every we possible need, obstacle. Absolutely. We need another hour to do this, but we, we just can't do it. We had, a, as the council is, is strict to time limits, we are out of time. We thank everyone for attending. Thank you, Governor Deal. No, thank you all because we need another hour and we'll continue with events about this report. So stay tuned to us and thank you all for tuning in today. Stay safe and well. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.